spirituality and how they play into activism and the political life of Chicano. Uh, she teaches here in the Department of Chicano and Latino Studies. Please give her a warm FYE welcome. Well, thank you so very much. Uh, I know it's tempting not to come to class today, given that you just came back from spring break and the weather is just phenomenal. So I appreciate you all being here. And I'm really grateful to the first year experienced staff and faculty uh, who made this possible for me to talk to you about a topic which is very um, important to me and one that I'm still trying to figure out and hopefully um, Maybe some of you will have some, will have some feedback for me. Um, you give me your ideas, your opinions, your suggestions in further developing these ideas around spiritual activism. Um, the, this is the latest anthology that I uh, worked on with, along with Dr. Irene Lara. And this whole idea of spiritual activism really doesn't have anything to do with the, the church or any particular uh, religion. I, I want you to think of spiritual um, activism. This is what we're really getting at. How spiritual activism can be used as an idea, an, an idea or a tool um, for creating you know, one's personal transformation your own transformation, um, and I'm not talking so much, you know, developmentally, you know, in the traditional psychological sense. I'm talking about a political transformation, okay? A, what we would call a human a transformation, and how that relates to creating social change in a larger society. Now, why am I particularly excited about this topic is given the political uh, moment in which we're living in today. I feel that what it, the group that is referred to as the millennial generation is at the forefront of a very critical moment in history. So let me say that again. It's, we are living, I believe, in what can be an extraordinary historical moment. And rarely do people get to live through such moments or even experience them. So I'm very, I feel very fortunate and very happy that I witnessed one movement and was a product of that movement, which was the 60s. Um, you know, and, and what happened in the 60s had, um, you know, it influenced our lives for the next, you know, 20 years. And that was a rare historical moment. And I know many of you have probably heard about the 60s, you're tired of hearing about it. Oh yeah, those people, you know, they did this, they did that. No one can ever live up to that historical moment. I truly believe that in my lifetime, and I feel very fortunate, that we will again witness another significant historical movement, and that's now. If we look at what the students have, have been doing in Florida, and how they've created an intergenerational movement, a movement across you know, um, race, ethnicity, class, et cetera, I don't think we'll have another such movement for another 50 or 60 years. So what I'm saying to all of you is tune in, okay? Tune in, because you are living through one of the most, which I feel potentially is an incredible, incredible historical moment. And I, for one, am very, very excited. Okay, so, um, so spiritual activism, I hope will, you know, some of the ideas that I'll be sharing with you um, can become important, you know, in um, social, in radical social transformation. So I want you to try and um, take your play, take your, take your thinking sense of self to another place or another way of thinking, you know, and I've challenged, you know, my students, I think I say a couple of them, from my other classes, you know, to really think beyond the boundaries, beyond the borders, you know, so that way you can, we, we can all have a better appreciation for the information that I'm going to share with you, okay? And my perspective, I come from what I call a Chicana indigenous perspective. Okay, and I call myself Chicana indigenous because as a woman, 
of Mexican descent who calls herself a Chicana as a result of the 60s. Um, I am fortunate to know about my Mexican indigenous background. My Mexican indigenous background is that of Otomi. Okay, so given that, you know, um, legacy in my life, you know, I, I refer to myself as a Chicana indigenous woman. So I'm going to come to you from, I'm going to talk with you from that perspective, okay? Think of, you know, being in a circle. This is not the hierarchy. I'm the professor with all the expertise and you're just there, you know, to take in information and regurgitate it at the end of the semester. But to really take in this information and try to understand it in relationship to your own lives or your own group that you belong to, your family or your community, okay? So, with that being said, as it says here, the knowledge I share with you is my gift of healing, learning, and transformation. And I think that in education, we do go through a process of healing. And what I mean by that is in understanding our life conditions, you know, we, there are various levels of oppression that many of us experience. Um, uh, oppression, exploitation, you know, et cetera, et cetera. And we just don't take it as, well, that just happens to be a life condition. But many of us, we, you know, it takes to heal from those situations so we can better, uh, be have a better appreciation for ourselves and the role that we're gonna play in society, okay? So healing, learning, and transformation. And so this positionality or my place in society or my place as a Chicana indigenous woman it, it reflects two, um, two indigenous expressions. And while I lived in Colorado at the same time as, your, as my dear friend and Professor Churchill, I was uh, very fortunate to be embraced by the Lakota people. Um, many of them refer to them as Sioux. Please don't ever call them that. They're Lakota, okay? And they have a saying that says, Mitakye o asin, which means all my relations and that we are all related. In other words, what you may do in the future, okay, what you may do in the future, say the way in which you vote in the future, is definitely going to have an impact on everyone's life, on my life, okay? So we're all, you know, related in that sense. We're all related in the sense as human beings, right? As people living in U.S. society. So that becomes important to recognize. And then there's also a Mayan expression, uh, in la que chile, it, I am like you. In other words, you know, we need to look at one another um, equally, you know, uh, re in a respectful manner as human beings, okay? And I keep using the word human beings because many of us are still striving to understand what it means to be human and to, re and to remain, you know, in this state of being, you know, a, a, a human being in society, okay? Um, okay, so what is spiritual, how am I looking then at spirituality? And as I said, I'm not looking at it from the traditional uh, religious context, even though in a lot of our work that we did in this book, we do look at religion and its role you know, that it's played uh, for Chicanas and Chicanos. It, you know, th the whole idea of spiritual activism can be applicable to everyone, okay? But for, for a working definition then, it's the essence of living, how we move through life to become human and be human. So we have to look at how are we living our lives? How are we living our lives in, in society? How do we negotiate our lives on a daily basis? And why is that even important? Okay, um, first of all, we have to recognize and value ourselves first and foremost as human beings. You're, you're thinking, well, that's you know, only logical, but you know, a lot of people don't recognize and respect one another as human beings. If we look at, for example, um, and I guess I don't have to apologize because I'm not one of your regular faculty in this class, but if we look at, for example, the elimination of the DACA program, um, are people really, those who made the decisions in power, are they really considering those individuals as human beings? Do they know what DACA students, for example, 
And not all DACA students are of Mexican descent, okay? There are students uh, of African descent, Asian descent. Um, do they really know what they go through um, as human beings every day? Let me just give you an example. How many of you, I mean, don't raise your hands, but how many of you in this room have to worry about getting a phone call every hour to find out whether or not your parents have been deported or whether or not an aunt and uncle has been deported, okay? That's the kind of life that many DACA students live. Um, there are a lot of DACA students who want to become involved in social movement, but can't. Why? Because then they would be exposed and they could get arrested and they could be, you know, the, uh, p potentially dangerous for them. I mean, many of, many of us in this room, you know, all we care about is what's going to happen at one o'clock, okay? And I hope that in, the, in your lifetime that you can get beyond, well, what's going to happen at one o'clock and be in the moment, you know, even if, if it's only for 30 more minutes, okay? It's not a lot to ask for in a lifetime, um, especially when someone is, is passionate about what they're talking about, someone who's passionate and and believes in this generation and that we will move toward radical transformation and the betterment for, for everyone. Okay, uh, so that's what that means, all right? Um, also, we must understand and respect our relationship and interconnectedness to other people. We need to care about other people. Um, just, you know, just because we don't know someone or we don't know the situation of individuals, um, we need to you know, we need to understand and respect you know, them as individuals. For example, the young man who was shot 20 times, 20 times, did not have a weapon, he was around your age, who was shot 20 times in his grandmother's backyard. And I know that you were born into a culture of violence and you're somewhat immune to it and you're used to hearing about violence, okay? Now our generation, yes, or generations before you, yes, we were subjected to various violences, but when they occurred, it rattled us, it shook us up, okay? So many of you may say, well, you know, he got shot, you know, uh, uh, you know what an uh, unfortunate incident. And it should, you should become rabid about that situation because we're talking about a young person who, whose cell phone was mistaken for a gun and was shot 20 times, okay, by two officers. We should care about that, okay? So that's what that means. To other people, plants. You know, um, people think plants. Well, what do plants do for us? First and foremost, they nourish and feed you. Okay, those of you who are vegetarians and you're, you know, onto the kale kick and whatever green kick you're on, you know, blah, blah, blah. I mean, every time you drink, I mean, you're getting those things because you're hoping that, you know, it's gonna make you healthy, keep you strong, you'll get through school. Well, you should be grateful, okay, for those plants. I mean, they, they mean something, all right? And um, the four-legged, you know, I'm glad that people, uh, you know, people can't understand from other countries, and I'll talk about my own country of origin, people from Mexico have a hard time with understanding why the four-legged are so protected. Now, why, have, why can't they understand? Because, because of colonization, they have been so disremoved from um, their relationship, you know, to the earth, to land, you know, to, I mean, to the earth, which is land, animals, etc. And maybe you'll be talking about, you know, conquest and colonization, you know, I'm, I'm sure you'll touch on that. But because of their experiences, people of Mexican descent are extremely detached from their own indigenous um, heritage, okay? And Mother Earth. Um, I, I think many of you, you know, just given the, the actions that are being taken in society today are, are much more conscientious, you know, about littering and recycling, and, you know, et cetera, et cetera. So that becomes important too. All those things we need to think about, you know, I think in our everyday, in our everyday lives, okay? All right, let's go on to this. Okay, now, I'm quoting from um, uh, Professor Churchill is pr probably very familiar with um, these authors, but this is Silvia Ledesma, who's a Mexican indigenous scholar, and 
what we're talking about is journeys. When we talk about our lives from indigenous or Mexican indigenous perspective, we talk about journeys, okay, that life is a journey and it truly, you know, can be. So in the journeys then, in these journeys that coming together as humanity, as a spiritual civilization, is the call to arms to young people as warriors to conquer our humanness and, and road to freedom. Um, this is a very powerful quote, and I think that we're beginning to see that these, this idea being implemented today with, you know, with the unfortunate incidents that began in Florida, but it really, it's a call to younger people. It doesn't mean that people my age or you know, people a little older than you are gonna fade out and just sit back and say, okay, you do all the work, no. But you really are the individuals because you're living in that moment, hopefully some of you who are living in that moment, are the ones who will be able to guide you know, and give us direction. So it is a call to young people you know, to take us to a spiritual civilization. I'm not talking about this, okay? Name father, no, no. We're talking about a spiritual civilization that refers to all the ideas that I just talked to you about. That relationship, you know, among us, plants, animals, moving toward, you know, what some people call democracy. Okay, but we refer to it as a spiritual civilization. Okay, um, it says we must proclaim ourselves as sovereign individuals and move towards co-creating a spiritual civilization to heal from exploitation, oppression, and racism. To heal from these different oppressive uh, conditions, it doesn't take, for example, let's say, um, you know, the exploitation that, and repression that Native American men experience, for example. It's not just Native American men who need to take part in that struggle, but the entire society. At what happened to, you know, the young African American man, the, the genocidal, you know, practices, we're gonna call them genocidal practices of, you know, uh, the police. I mean, I hate to put it so, you know, bluntly, but those are, cons I mean, many of us consider it as genocidal practices, but we have to work together. It's not just one group's responsibility, and we have to learn how it, you know, who, you know, people's and individual roles. The com every community plays a different role, okay? given where they're at, where they're socially located in society. All right, so that becomes very important. So this is something that um, I believe in. I think spirituality, or the way that we're looking at spiritual civilization, is revolutionary, and that revolution is spiritual. And um, I, I think, again, you know, it becomes an important or critical way of thinking and being, you know, for the political moment that we're living in now. And I know when people see the word revolution, it's like, <gasps> you know, um, you know, right away, you know, people have this, I don't, well, at least my generation and maybe generations before you, but maybe all of you are more accustomed to hearing the, the term, but, you know, it used to be, you know, a, a bad word, you know, revolution, how do you talk about revolution, you know? When, in fact, the U.S., um, many you know, racial, we'll look at racial ethnic groups and even the working class, there have been many revolutionary movements in this country. And unfortunately, in our traditional history courses, we, don't, we look at them simply as social movements. We don't look at them as radical revolutionary transformations. Okay? Okay. Um, any questions or comments or suggestions or, or to these ideas? Because right now I'm just sharing with you, um, you know, this book that we wrote on uh, spiritual activism, the general ideas, you know, that we're trying to share with people. And if they're unclear, please, you know, I, I'd be more than happy to provide clarification. Yes? We are humans, but how we are humans in society is the question, okay? Now, you can be a human being in U.S. society and just simply go through um, being an individual who just, you know, I'm gonna live the traditional life course and just, and just exist. But to live is, you know, involves contributing to society and, and making that society the type of society we want. Because 
people all have, you know, everyone has an idea of the type of society they want to live in. And, you know, that imaginary, right? Not, you know, when we say imagination, again, people think, oh, you know, you're thinking like a little kid. No, that imaginary, that political imaginary, all, you know, everyone has an idea of what kind of world they want to live in. Well, it's not going to come to you. You have to make it happen, okay? So that's the difference. You know, we're all human, yes, and we can all live our lives, but if you, we want things to be different, it's not just going to happen. Okay, we have to be a part of, the, of those changes. Yeah, thanks for the question. Yes, what is your name? My name is Cole. Cole. Um, I just wanted to, you used the term uh, police genocidal practices. Uh-huh. Oh, what I meant was, um, okay, when we talk about genocide, you know what genocide means, right? Is the elimination or the, you know, it may be unconscious or conscious at this point, you know, elimination of a group of individuals. Uh, or community, or what have you, and many people are questioning. Um, you know the cert well. Many people are questioning the the way in which uh, people are being handled by police officers. Okay, and many of them have s stated it reflects a sense of genocide. If we're looking at the numbers of young, you know, African American men who have been subjected to what many are saying, you know, police violence. So this is a, a narrative, a dialogue that's taking place among, you know, the communities. So I wanted to share that with you. Yeah, thank you. Yeah, cool. Anyone else? Anyone else? Okay, so that's the basic ideas around this uh, I, uh, of, uh, concept of spiritual activism. So I'm just laying out the general ideas and then, you know, if there's something that you don't understand or if I'm using a term that is unclear, thank you, Cole, please let me know because I try to clarify, you know, uh, all my concepts or words that I, you know, that I use. I feel that professors who don't clarify their concepts, you know, it maintains a hierarchy and I'm not here to maintain a hierarchy. I'm here to become your ally, you know, in addition to sharing knowledge with you, I want to be an ally. I want you to remember the old lady, you know, in Cal's. You know, hey, we, why don't we call that old lady that talked to us? Maybe she'll, you know, you know, uh, get involved in our movement. You're supposed to laugh. Anyway, okay, <laughs> it didn't work. All right, all right. Um, okay, so where does spiritual activism begin then? Um, you know, spiritual activism, you know, you, many people ask this question, um, and, and the let me clarify something here. The idea of spiritual activism is not my own. I didn't, you know, whoa. Oh, that's me, sorry. I was like, did somebody fall? Um, I didn't create that term. Um, I, I, uh, the, the author who brought forth this term was Gloria Anzaldúa. But other people, Ledesma, and many uh, indigenous scholars have also used the term spiritual activism. But I refer to it the way in which Gloria Anzaldúa, may she rest in peace, she's no longer with us, um, she was considered um, you know, a, a leading theorist, a person who does you know, Chicana lesbian theory in um, Chicano, and La Chicano and Chicana studies. And so I draw a lot from her work, and I, and I really regret not being able to be here, I think it was a week ago Monday, uh, Ana Louise Keating, who worked very closely with Gloria Anzaldúa and still provides this incredible platform, who herself, she was one of my editors for this book, by the way, um, is incredible. And she was here uh, Monday, uh, uh, last a week from, from Monday, or before Monday. And, uh, but unfortunately, so uh, many of the ideas, you know, I, I'm heavily influenced, let me say that, by Gloria Anzaldúa and many scholars. Okay, so where, did, so where does it begin? You know, Gloria talked, Anzaldúa and Ana Louise Keating talked about spiritual activism. Well, where does it begin? Um, it begins with the personal. All of us, you know, have to look toward, we have to do some very critical self-reflection. Um, and then, you know, acknowledging our radical interconnectedness. In other words, you know, when we talked about, or when I talked about us being, you know, um, all related, you know, radically interrelated, connected, interconnected, sorry. So we really have to do some self-reflection, you know. Um, 
that's part of this process of, of what, it, what it is to be human or, or you know, to maintain this sense of humanity in a spiritual civilization. I mean, I'm talking, we have to seriously look you know, do critical self-reflection. And I think that can happen, you know, given this is the first year experience, the professors that you have and what they're trying to share with you. Um, I think they're really trying um, to help you uh, or, or trying to guide you and assist you in becoming a critical thinker. And that's what's really important. You know, the majority of our society, you know, they're, they're not critical thinkers. You know. Um, you know, journalism, for example, or journalists have noted that when the news is provided on television, that it's done at a level of, say, um, someone who has an eighth grade education. Okay, so it's just informing people. But there, people don't, people receive information, but they're act, not actually learning anything from it. Okay, they're, you know, people will react and say, oh, that's terrible. Here we go again, and blah, 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 blah. Okay, did the Warriors win last night? That seems to be what's most important, right? I mean, it is important, because I'm a Warrior fan. Um, so, but it's not the most important thing, right? I mean, and I'm also, um, you know, go uh, Mississippi State or, or South Carolina. I don't want to see UConn up there again. Women's basketball. Okay, anyway. Um, now, this, is, this becomes part of the process, too, you know, this reflection. And then, spirituality for social change recognizes the many differences among us, yet insists on our commonalities and uses these commonalities as catalysts for transformation. The most challenging thing, now, it, it's, easy, it's easy for us to come together under commonalities. And when we get together, we can share those commonalities and talk about those commonalities. For example, you're all students here at Sonoma State University, okay? You have a commonality as a community of students, okay? Say there's a particular issue that you wanna work on. For example, the raising of your tuition which is gonna happen, I think, unfortunately, right? This is what I've been reading. If you come together as a community of students and you critically look at how those tuition hikes are going to affect different individuals, then that's what you need to focus on as a group of students. You know, for example, to say, well, you know, this group of students um, are gonna get hit the hardest, uh, this group of students, maybe it won't be too, too uh, difficult on them, but it's the differences that, will, that should bring you together, and those, it's the differences then that, that um, help you and guide you to work on a particular issue. Say, for example, you, know, you go out and you, know, you have demonstrations or whatever, what have you, you write letters or, you know, against tuition hikes. But not only do you learn how different people are affected, but you develop new relationships among yourselves. And that's what's important. It's important for different organizations, you know, think of it as a huge house, and everybody has to go to their room and figure it out, okay? But then you come to the dining room table, and you say, okay, this is a situation for this community, this is a situation for that community. That's where you build strength. It's not on the commonalities, it's the differences, okay? And it's not always easy either. So, I mean, there, you know, with social change comes tremendous conflict, okay? So, that's something else that we also talk about, or, you know, this, how does this quote unquote work, if you will. Okay, now. This becomes, you know, part of that, that idea of being human and, and maintaining this sense of humanity. And I draw again from uh, Gloria Anzaldú and Ana Castillo um, in this particular part of the, um, of the book. So, you know, when I asked my elders, well, how do, how do you go about doing this? And some of the questions that they said, that they proposed to me, is 
they noted, we need to ask questions. We need to ask ourselves, what can I bring to this life? Okay, what can I bring to this life? We need to be active, not passive, um, observers of life. And many of us, you know, naturally, I mean, you're young. You know what, you're all 18, 19, 20 years old. So you're probably in this mode of being, <clears throat> you're participating in life, you're living life, but you're, you're, you're being passive observers. And, or, you know, at this time, you know, we're being passive observers. So what Ana Castillo says is that if we just simply move through life and try to get from one day to the next, and I know it's hard to get from one day to the next, but if you incorporate this idea of spiritual activism, getting from one day to the next will be completely different. You know, it, she argues then that that is more of a male principle, if you will, okay, where Social transformation, you know, she says that we need to move toward what she calls the feminine, you know, or the feminist um, principle, which means to move beyond, you know, being passive. And there are many men today, <coughs> excuse me, there are many men today who read the works of Anzaldúa and Castillo and who, who do consider themselves feminist. And that's a whole other conversation that your faculty, your faculty can get into with you. So they do consider themselves feminists because they see that many times, you know, men do stay in this, not all men, but a great number of men stay in this role of just, you know, going through life and being passive observers because, you know, they're able to re retain their privileges. Okay, so for men to really get involved, you know, with with women, you know, at a political level, many times they have to relinquish, you know, their, um, their privileges, okay? Because they are, men, whether they want them or not, are granted privileges that many women are not granted, okay? And that's a whole other conversation that you can get into as well, since our time is, is, is short here, and I wanna get some more feedback from you. Now, then moving back to another idea, uh, a related idea, is, is called the decolonization. And I want to talk a little bit about that, what that term means. So the decolonization of indigenous Chicana bodies and the reclaiming of their spirits is a struggle for their human rights as women. So in general, uh, if we're looking at Chicanas, for example, um, there are marginalized, you know, a population, not unlike Native American women, you know, African American, Asian, queer women, uh, you know, women of color, if we're just talking about women. Um, to reclaim our sense of humanity as women of Mexican descent and to move beyond, you know, the margins that, we're, that we occupy in society, to, be, to become more of the, no, what, what I mean by this, and it's very complicated, but to be, acknowledged and respected, um, as we were talking about earlier, this sense of respect, you know, for an acknowledgement for women, of, let's just say, you know, this is a very specific example of women of Mexican descent. That's very important for us. So when we talk about decolonization, what we're really referring to, and again, I'm sure you'll talk about this in your other classes or what have you, when we, what we mean by decolonization is that, you know, um, Spain was, you know, conquered by, um, I'm sorry, Mexico was, con was colonized by Spain, and then later on, you know, um, you know the, the, the conquest of the Southwest, which took place, you know, by the United States. So there's this historical legacy of colonization, you know, that has taken place. And so when we talk about decolonization, what we're trying to do is really to move forward in spaces that are uh, where one is respected, where there's a, more, you know, there's a sense of freedom. So decolonization then involves a process, first of all, of recognizing a history of oppression it, for many people. But again, I'm just talking specifically about people of Mexican descent. Women, we need to recognize, well, what has been our history? How have we been treated historically in the Americas? 
and and what and what consequences has that had for has that have has that had for us now in contemporary United States society? You know, history has its 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 effects. You know, it, it's not that you know a historical moment happens and then there's no effects or there's you know people are not affected for for years after. So how then has you know conquest and colonization affect <coughs> excuse me affected the lives of women of mexican descent so we want to understand that what is our history you know um many of us are not taught our history so that's what that means first of all is learning about our history you know who where did we come from and how did we get here and you know etc cetera, etc cetera. okay is that clear yeah all right i'm going to go a uh, couple more minutes and then I really want to get some of your feedback. Um, um, okay, this gets into, this is a little kind of theoretical stuff, um, which I think I might, basically what this says is that the way w women of Mexican descent, oh, sorry, Chicanas, or someone like myself, I'll, I'll just use myself as an example to uh, clarify this. That was me, sorry Scott, that will um, make this a little clearer. Who I am today, um, I have been influenced by, you know, culture and various cultures, not just Mexican culture, but mainstream culture, indigenous culture, and cultures beyond the U.S. border. One in particular that I have been heavily influenced by is Cuba. I've been traveling to Cuba since 1990, and I have lived in Cuba, and I've witnessed um, and wit witnessed the socialist revolution. Um, I've lived under it, only temporary, but as a privileged North American, which I had to take into consideration. I'm also very familiar with the Chapaneca or the Zapatista revolution in Mexico. I also lived with the Zapatista people for a summer. I was asked to go down there to take testimonials of how um, the Mexican army, supp heavily supported by the United States, was devastating these indigenous communities in the jungles of Mexico. So that, that's what we mean by it being transnational. I also had the privilege of living in Spain for a year and a half. I went to school, and I really encourage all of you all of you get out of the U.S., go to another country, and study seriously, and you will learn so much more about yourself in relationship to U.S. society. Okay, I really, really encourage you to do that. And I think, and I will say this, I never like to say this to people, but if you don't, you're gonna regret it. You will, because it is the most enriching, um, incredible experience. So that's, that's what this means, you know. All of these experiences have shaped me who I am, like my political identity, my cultural identity, and even how I express my sexuality, okay? So th that's what that means. And you need to take that into consideration. Um, let's see. This term is a term by um, Paulo Freire, who a uh, Brazilian uh, educator, scholar, brilliant, um, unfortunately passed away uh, years ago, and he talks about a sense of consciousness. And I, I think this is important, and I'll, I'll leave it on this note, because there's other slides, but, you know, this sense of consciousness that Paulo Ferreri talks about, it's a, it's a consciousness of an individual's own political positions in the world, and what that means in terms of finding ways to create change. So again, you know, the encouragement here is that critical self-reflection, you know, to take those experiences and to really think about, you know, what, 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 how do I want to participate in this society? Where do I want to contribute? How do I want to be? And, you know, it, can, it, it, it becomes a way of living. It may sound like it's exhausting. You know, it is. It can be. I mean, because you're doing serious work. But, you know, that's being in the moment of history. That's being in the moment of your life journey. You know, so that, that's the encouragement, and, and I'm hoping that 
spirit, this idea of spiritual activism, you know, will, I already feel that there are elements of spiritual activism in today's movement, um, in the current movement that's occurring, uh, you know, to, regarding gun violence and what, and what have you, but also education and patriarchy or sexism, it's another word for patriarchy. But um, I think, you know, again, I, I can't stress enough if, you know, when you're, if you, if you, if you could just stay in the moment for 30 minutes, you know, without talking to your friend and laughing and giggling and, you know, wondering what you're gonna do at one o'clock, playing on your computer, playing on your phone, sleeping, whatever it is you're doing right now, um, that's, that's, all, that's all it can take is just, you know, being in the moment two or three times a day and really taking in, you know, what people are sharing with you. Um, because we do this because um, we're passionate about what we do. Um, you know, I have other things that I could be doing, but this is really important to me. And I want to build relationships with your generation. I want to be a part of that movement as well. You know, I was very young when the first movement started. I was in middle school, but yet I was very active, you know, because I had parents who were very active you know, with the United Farm Workers, with, you know, the Democratic Party. I had the privilege of shaking the hand of somebody you probably don't even know or heard of, of Bobby Kennedy. And, you know, so I was, I marched, you know, to the Capitol with Cesar Chavez and Dolores Huerta. And so all those things, you know, um, helped me to develop, to be the person I am today. So we have about two or three minutes. And I really would like to, I mean, if you have feedback, maybe you can give it to Professor, you know, Churchill. Um, or, you know, P Professor Scott, Professor Mary, I either one of them. Um, but, you know, I hope that, um, I wish you the very best, you know, here at Sonoma. Oh, you have, did you have a question or? I totally have a question. Oh, okay. Don't ask me anything I can't answer. <laughs> Uh huh. And I think a lot of us have the idea that a spiritual life retreats from the world. Right. You know, like that? Like you Good go point. to a cell and you pray for the rest of your life or you meditate, you know, in a, in a. So, can you talk from a, I hope, a personal perspective about exactly. how actually engaging with the world is spiritual and how it helps you create an inner sense of meaning and purpose in your life? Absolutely, yes. I think, thank you for that question. That is so important. When I'm talking about the spirituality, I'm not talking about going off and meditating for an hour or, I mean, which is fine, you can do that. But this is actually engaging in society. You know, here as a student at Sonoma State University, um, you know, I engage in spiritual, in spiritual activism, I think, via my classes, you know, where I'm trying to, um, move my students in thinking critically, or you know, the movements that happened this past week were actually going to an activity, learning about it, um, how to be a part of it. So it does take energy. You know, it's not like, okay, I'm gonna go home and I'm just gonna, you know, which is great. I'm, I have not, you know, cause I do yoga and all that, and Tai Chi, whatever. And that, those, those are other forms of spirituality that are very healing for people and are important you know, for you to continue to engage in society. But this is a societal engagement. Thank you so much for this question. It's a societal engagement rather than retreating and being at peace, you know, just by yourself and only yourself, okay? That's what that refers to, yeah. Any other questions or comments? Well, I wanna thank you so very much. Good luck with, uh, your, with your education here and your journey at Sonoma State. Thank you. Have a great day.